Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thank you for staying with us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. According to the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. Healthy living consists of the steps, actions and strategies we use to achieve health and well-being. Non-communicable diseases, or what we call NCDs, kill 41 million people each year, equivalent to 74% of all deaths globally. Each year, 17 million people die from an NCD before the age of 70. Cardiovascular diseases account for most NCD deaths, or 17.9 million people annually, followed by cancers, 9.3 million, chronic respiratory diseases, 4.1 million, and diabetes, 2 million, including kidney disease deaths caused by diabetes. These four groups of diseases account for over 80% of all premature NCD deaths. My guest on the show today is Medical Director of QLife Family Clinic, Dr. Yinka Olowojolu. You're welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. I wouldn't have pegged cancer as uh, a lifestyle sort of disease. Is it one of them or it's just put in the list? Oh, well, it's, it's an apt description and it's an accurate categorization because what we've recognized is that many cancers, there are few that probably are not lifestyle, but most cancers are actually linked to lifestyle choices. Think about it, when we were younger, in fact, when I was in medical school, many cancers were not being diagnosed in Nigeria and we thought they were rare. Yes, maybe we didn't have the diagnostic facilities to do so at that time, but then also the increasing incidence of these cancers is linked to the fact that many people have now changed their lifestyle patterns to mirror what happens in the Western world. And so we're also beginning to have those cancers here in Nigeria. Take, for instance, lung cancer is obviously linked to smoking, which is a lifestyle issue. Right? And several other cancers that are linked to particular patterns of behavior, which can be managed by lifestyle choices. Okay, so that follows through to the question I want to ask next, which is how much of these diseases can we prevent or keep at bay by proper lifestyle choices? You know, like you said, right now in Nigeria and many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, we're no longer dealing with only infectious diseases as we had in the past, but the burden of disease is now shifting towards non-communicable diseases. And actually, out of the 10 major risk factors for disease and disability, about 80% of them are linked to lifestyle choices which means That's that a it's a lot, really. And so, yes, there are some things that we can't control. We can't control our biology, right? You can't control the things that have a genetic link, but there are those other ones that do have lifestyle um, choices that we can modify. And in fact, even some of those biologically linked diseases, take for instance, breast cancer. You must have heard the story of, I think it's Angelina Jolie, Yes, who had the double mastectomy. Exactly, which was prophylactic, meaning she that's recognized that... Quite extreme. Yes, that is extreme, but that's just an example of even when there are biological links, there are still steps we can take to at least reduce, reduce the risk or maybe control the severity of those conditions. Okay, we've been told time and again that healthy lifestyle choices begin from childhood. Can you explain some of that? Yeah, I agree completely. You see, there are a number of things that the building blocks, so to speak, are laid in childhood. And so the choices that we make as parents regarding the health of our children will then play a role in how those children turn out. Good example. Because of how some of us were brought up, um, People would say, oh, I didn't get to eat this when I was young. Okay. I must give it to my children. Mm -hmm. And then we're beginning to see a lot of children that are overweight and perhaps even obese. Now, obesity in childhood may not be a problem for the child now, 
but it's laying build, building blocks for diabetes and hypertension later in life for the child. That's just an example. The decisions you make, for instance, to immunize your children in childhood will play a role in those children and, and the pattern of disease that they will develop later in life. Recently, Lagos State launched the cervical ca um, cancer vaccine. Yes, that's the human papilloma vaccine. Yes, the uptake is low. Meanwhile, because the... people are scared. Yes, really, people are scared. I, I, I agree with you. They think that you. they're going to kill their girls and stuff like that. Yes, it's that bad. I understand, but I'm just using that as an example where your choice as a parent on what to do for your child at an early age can have an impact on how that child will then turn out in terms of healthy living later in the future. So for instance, girls at that age, starting from age nine, who can be immunized against the human papilloma virus, then stand a chance to be protected against cervical cancer later in life, life compared to those who don't have the vaccine. And that's how sometimes a number of those things actually start from childhood and then build up into adulthood. So, really, immunization is a lifestyle choice that could cut away a lot of diseases. Yes, oh. completely. Then, how about breastfeeding? You know, that's also another major one. Right? When we were younger, most women would breastfeed for a long period, right? Sometimes up to three years, up right? To the child is saying, Mommy, I want breastfeed. <laughs> and, and the truth is, as much as medical science has improved and we've tried to get breast milk substitutes, there is nothing that is still better than breast milk. And breastfeeding your child for at least six months prepares the child for a healthy life, helps the child to have more immunity. Um, and all of that, and reduces allergies and, and a number of things. I actually read somewhere that uh, breast milk um, sort of helps your child not to be obese. Because, you see, it's the child that controls the breastfeeding. Okay. Yeah? And when the child is full, the child will not suck. When the child doesn't suck, you won't produce as much breast milk, right? And it's, it, that's just the way it's regulated compared to when you give the child a breast milk substitute that contains several other things and then the child may feed more and then start to develop obesity from a young age. So that's the way it works. You were talking about um, allergies. Yes. That um, it, it can, breastfeeding can... Can reduce. reduce. It doesn't allergies. stop. The reason is that a number of breast milk substitutes will contain some substances that may prime your child. Okay. So, you know, usually the way allergy works is that the first time the child is exposed or a human being is exposed to that substance... Yes, it's usually the second time it's the that second is bad. time, Exactly, right? So if you do not expose the child to any of those allergens early enough, then it means that there's still that protection a bit against development of allergies later in life. So we've been taught that trans fats it looks like we've been talking about food for a while, <laughs> but well, we've been, we've been told that trans fats are um, unhealthy, but now literally everything you pick up in a store says trans fat free. Have we overcome that hurdle? Well, I wouldn't say we have, <laughs> right? Because there are still a number of products that are still in the market that do have trans fat. But whether or not a product has trans fat doesn't mean it's completely healthy for you. The truth is that the natural meals are still better. Okay. Better than processed meals. And so, in fact, when we talk about diet and healthy living, the advice is to stick as much as possible to natural meals. Natural food. Yes. Which the body can more easily process and utilize in um, for your for your health. Do, do some of these natural foods cause obesity? What really is the is the culprit when it comes when it to comes obesity? to obesity? So you see, it depends on how your body, individual bodies, um, handle meals. So which is why we would always talk about eating in moderation. So the general advice we would give is that you should have an assortment of different food types in your plate and not just fixate on, on specific things. 
You know, sometimes when you look at a person's meal or the plate, it's supposed to be a reflection of how rich the person is. And most times people are thinking in terms of proteins, yeah? Okay. So, yes, they, they are. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, in some families, you will know who is oldest by the large portion of protein that is in the meal. Definitely. Usually it's the man. And the man would have several pieces of meat or chicken. Meanwhile, really, as an adult, it, it should be the other way around. You should have less of that and more of other things in your meal, if you understand what I mean, right? Uh, and so as, as you eat, natural meals can still make you obese. That's the truth. So it's about eating in moderation, recognizing how your own body processes those meals and because there are different people that we may need to give specific advice about how to, um, what to eat. For instance, you go for a check and you already recognize that your cholesterol levels are high. Mm -hmm. We will then give you specific food recommendations to ensure that you are, you are taking less cholesterol in your meals. That's the kind of example I'm giving. But the general rule is to eat in moderation, different food types. So I'm saying starch, vegetables, fruits, um, legumes, nuts, and all of that being part of your diet, including water. Including water. Very lots important. Of water, right? Yes. And, and less of things processed. Yeah, less of things processed. So after eating, it's time to move. Ah. Last week, you did a lot of moving. How much exercise does one need? And, and does it vary according to the age of the person? Well, so I'll say generally for an adult we would recommend about 150 minutes of exercise per week. 150 minutes. That can be broken into 30 minutes daily for five days. Right. And so depending on what you need to do or what the targets are, some people need to lose weight. 150 minutes a week may not be enough to achieve that. Some people are already diabetic. And we need them to be more physically active to also control their blood sugar. You do? Yes. Diabetic people? Yes. Okay. Yes, they, they need exercise to control their blood sugar. Otherwise, what will happen is as long as they remain sedentary and they sit down, whatever they eat would only just continue to accumulate and then their blood sugar levels can increase. So that's the kind of example. But it's generally about 150 minutes per week. And when we say exercise, we don't necessarily mean you have to go to the gym and lift weights. <laughs> you can just walk like we did last week, Saturday. So it can be walking, it can be swimming, it can be jogging. Uh, and it's important to just do it graduated from one level to the other. And what we always say is any movement is better than no movement at all. What so, do you mean when you say graduated from one level to the other? Yeah, so for instance, if you've never exercised before, you shouldn't just start jogging. Start from a walk. And then do, you don't necessarily have to achieve 30 minutes a day when you start. Start from five minutes. Okay. And then as your body adjusts, then you just increase gradually till you get to that target. Okay, so people have spoken of different types of exercises. I don't know what category... Uh, walking falls into maybe aerobics but they put a lot of uh, importance on strength training weight bearing you you help me out there okay no are so necessary no so they are they are not completely necessary for everybody what we would rec recommend from a healthcare point of view especially if what you're just targeting is healthy living is aerobic exercises so walking walking swimming jogging yeah, so not necessarily weight-bearing or strength training. Depending on what you do, if you're an athlete, if um, your work would involve or your regular day-to-day -day activity would, would require more of that, then yes, you should also include some bit of strength training in your exercise routine. All right. Will, I'd love to ask you another question, <laughs> but I have to wait for the break. Let's go on a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking about tips for healthy living on Health Matters on Channels Television. And 0808-054-2233 is the number you can call if you have questions on the topic. You can also send a message on x at ctv underscore Mary A or send me email using moalale at channelstv.com while we talk about the rest of what we have.
we were speaking about um, exercise, yeah. but we didn't mention maybe do we taper it as we get older or oh. change it? Okay, yes. So, again, it depends on your own health, your health status, or your health condition. At the walk on Saturday, there was, I think, a 70-something-year-old man who was there with us. And it's not just that he walks once a year. He regularly engages in walking, right? And so, in fact, what I would expect is that as people grow older, it will be other forms of exercise that they can probably won't taper down. So strength training may not be as intense as before, but the aerobic type, please still continue. That's good. Walking at 70, it's a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so how about somebody, a woman, for example? You know, a lot of women have osteoporosis as they grow older. Should they just continue with their aerobics? With the aerobics? Yes, normally? because you see, in fact, exercise helps with bone health. Okay. So not exercising would actually worsen the osteoporosis but not strength training this time because okay. you know osteoporosis would will make them susceptible to um fractures yeah. um let's go to mental health mm -hmm. what do we do to ensure optimal mental health very good question because many times people associate mental health with madness mm -hmm. no but that's not what that is talking about it's simply talking about the a fully functioning men mental state. And so there are, num there are a number of things that would contribute to mental health. And it's about how we deal or handle regular life stress, um, how we cope with changing environment, or even difficulties that happen in life. Okay. And so, for instance, having healthy relationships with family, with friends, knowing how to cope with stress. You see, stress is a normal reaction to pressure. And in fact, sometimes stress is good in terms of it helps you to deal with the situation. For instance, you have a deadline. The normal stress reaction will help you be more alert. Speed up. To speed up, it will help you stay awake, maybe longer, so that you can meet up with your work. The problem then is when the stress reactions continue for too long and then begin to have a toll on your body, either physically or mentally. So for your mental health, we would say, learn how to manage stress. For instance, meditation. Just being able to sit still, to have positive thoughts, in fact, now we, we now even medically advocate things like forgiveness. Oh. Yes, because okay. forgiveness does have a, an effect you, on your mental you, health. Did you, by chance, measure some sort of uh, hormone being, being uh, brought out by unforgiveness, some sort of... Well, not necessarily hormones. Now, stress does lead to release of hormones. Okay. Hormones like cortisol, um, adrenaline, you know, all of those, which when released in, in large quantities and over a long period of time can have a toll on your physical body, oh. on particular organs. Okay. But forgiveness has been found through medical research that see people who forgive are able to live more healthy. They're happier. Yes, they're happier. They are happier. <laughs> In fact, when you do not forgive, you are not just hurting the other person, you're hurting yourself. And so as part of, and, and I'm not talking, I'm not even talking of, this is not religious, this is medical, right? So being able to live free of any hurts does help your mental state. Now, many places, and, and I'm saying offices and organizations, do have an employee assistance program where they have mental health experts who can speak to their, their employees or their employees can reach out to when, when they are undergoing different kinds of stress. So having all those things in place, visiting a mental health specialist and having a consultation doesn't mean that you are we mad. We ought to talk about these things more. I agree. People who don't just stand up and say, oh, I really need to see somebody about my mental health. <laughs> not in Nigeria, not now. Oh, well, that is changing. Right. Uh, and yes, it, it may be in just a few pockets, 
But, but that is changing, especially since COVID. Because you see, COVID didn't just, with the lockdowns, didn't just affect people um, from an infectious point of view, but it also brought a lot of psychological toll. People were now kept in their houses and had to deal with things that they had not dealt with in a long time. And even loneliness. Loneliness, yes, I agree. Uh, and I would say perhaps maybe in this part of the world, many, many, many people didn't feel it that much because you see, just culturally, we, we associate with family, we associate with friends. And we and... scream our <laughs> greetings from our doors. <laughs> from hey, our doors. hi, how are you doing? <laughs> and you may have seen recently some people who have actually left the country mm. complaining about loneliness. Yes. Because in other parts of the world, it's not exactly as it is here. And, but those are the steps that we can take with regards to our mental health. Maintaining good relationships with friends, with family, being able to speak, having accountability partners, people that you can speak with, um, seeing your doctor from time to time, just to unburden. I, I know patients who come, and when they, when they come in, they first, maybe the first 30 minutes, they're just tell, talking about the things that they are facing. And they leave feeling relieved. It's almost as if up to 30 to 50% of their concerns are gone simply by just talking. talking. I have to stop <laughs> you there. Thank you so much for coming to the show thank and you giving very us much. these healthy <laughs> tips. And thank you so much, you also, back there at home, in the office, or wherever you're watching. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. I am Mary Alalevi.